Hello and welcome to this recorded session on mean, median and mode. My name is Charmaine Phelps and I'm a Provider Development Officer here at NCFE. If you would like the slides that accompany this recording, please email me charmainephelps at ncfe.org.uk and if you send me the name of your centre and if possible your NCFE centre number, I'll be able to send those slides across. The objective of this session is to explore approaches to teaching mean, median and mode, including finding the mean from a group frequency table. First of all, we'll take a look at the prior knowledge that learners need before looking at mean, median, mode and range. Then we'll look at comparing data sets. We'll look at finding the mean from a frequency table. Then grouped data, calculating the mean from a grouped frequency table. We'll take a look at some assessment questions and then we'll end with a short summary. The subject content statements that we'll cover in this session are shown on this slide. So from level one, find the mean and range of a set of quantities. And then from level two, calculate the median and mode of a set of quantities, estimate the mean of a group frequency distribution from discrete data, and use the mean, median, mode, and range to compare two data sets. Now, before beginning any subject, it's always a good idea to consider the prior knowledge that learners need uh, before they can handle a topic. So in the live session, we set this as an activity, so you can just have a little moment to think about this for yourself. What prior knowledge do learners need before they can calculate mean, median and mode, calculate the mean from a group frequency table and use mean, median and mode and range to compare data sets. By all means, pause the recording. Otherwise, I'm going to share with you uh, what the attendees at the live sessions came up with now. So for the range, they need to be able to subtract. The mean, they need to be able to add and divide. They need to be able to identify the smallest and largest number. They need to be able to add multiple values. They need to be able to identify the midpoint of a group frequency set. They may need to understand negative numbers. And quite often they need to know how to use a calculator. And if they know how to use the memory buttons on uh, just an ordinary basic calculator, it will actually save them quite a bit of time in finding the mean from a group frequency table. You will find that any question that comes up in a live assessment that's on calculating the mean from a group frequency table will always appear in the calculator section rather than in the non-calculator section. So prior knowledge from the subject content statements uh, from entry level three, they do need to be able to add and subtract using three digit whole numbers. And then from level one, add, subtract, multiply and divide decimals up to two decimal places. And also from level one, they need to be able to group discrete data and represent group data graphically. Having an understanding of how data is grouped is going to help them to understand how to manage data when it is grouped, if they've got that prior understanding first. So we'll take a look at mean, median, mode and range. And again, in the live sessions, we did this as an activity. So by all means, you can pause the recording and to consider the questions here. How do you teach mean, median, mode and range? How do you help learners to remember the differences? What practical activities do you use to consolidate or kickstart understanding? And how do you link mean, median, mode and range to your learners' life, work or study? I'll show you what the attendees popped down. So for how do they teach it? We got um, attendees use the CGP books, YouTube, MathSpot and also BKSB. How do you help learners to remember the differences? There's the hey diddle diddle, the medians, the middle rhyme, um, which is quite a good one. Uh, practical activities might be doing a survey of electronic devices kept at home and then linking 
it to learners life work or study linking to groups of children in assessments and finding an average so, um, so as an example for the early years and teaching assistant so rather than spend time during this recording looking at how to calculate mean median mode uh, and range um, I've just put some useful links here for you so that we can move on to actually comparing data sets uh, which is something that learners typically find more difficult than actually doing the calculations so boss maths uh, there's a, a free resource there it's quite useful for practicing finding the mean third space learning this link gives an explanation of mean median and mode there's powerpoints here reviewing prior knowledge before moving on to mean median and mode and then MathPad, I quite like this because it's quite useful for reasoning and problem solving. Um, so as an example, there's questions like, can you find four numbers with a mean of five? And ultimately, uh, you're faster learners if you set this as a question. And by all means, have a think about how you'd solve this yourself now. Um, your faster learners will, will quickly realize that if any four numbers that add up to 20 are going to give a mean of five um, and another question slightly more difficult can you find five numbers with a range of five a mean of four and a median of three and again pause the recording see if you can uh, think of an answer and uh, in trying to think of the answer for yourself or an answer because there are a few um, think about how that might help your learners how your learners would respond if you set a question like that for them, maybe as a bit of a starter, get them thinking. So we're going to move on to comparing data sets. So we know what the mean is. The mean is often referred to as the average. However, it's not the only measure of average. To find the mean of a set of data, we just add up all the data and divide by the total number of values that we have. We can use the mean to compare data sets. So as an example, we've got the test scores for two learners who've been sitting math tests scored out of 40 over the past year. Hamza scored the following in his math tests and Molly scored the following on her math tests. We can calculate the mean of both data sets to make a comparison between the two learners' results. Pause the recording and you can do the calculation. Um, and you should find that Hamza has a, a mean score of 28, Molly has a mean score of 24. But what, what does that mean? What can we say? And, and this is quite often the hard bit for learners because then they might have to, you know, say something about that. They might be able to do the calculations, but what can we then therefore say? Well, what, what we could say is that Hamza has a higher average score, so we could say that he's performing better than Molly. It's important that when you do cover statistical measures, you raise the importance of what our calculations tell us, not just doing the actual calculations themselves. There are times when using the median as a measure of average can be misleading as it discards all data except for the most central value. So we've got a question here. Jack wants to cut down on his screen time. So he records the number of minutes he spent on his phone last week. So we've got these number of minutes. He tries to spend less time on his phone and records the amount of time he spends the following week. And we can see actually that like all of the numbers are lower you know, on a day by day basis. He uses the median value to compare his screen time. Explain why Jack is unhappy after using the median to make his comparison. So take a moment to come up with an answer for yourself and then we'll review it. So ultimately the med median is the middle value. So we've got seven days, so it's gonna be the fourth value. So if we put them in order from lowest to highest, uh, in the first week, our middle value is the Monday, 125. So that's the median for the first week. And then if we look at the second week, we can see that our fourth value is also 125. So why is Jack unhappy? He's unhappy 
because in spite of cutting down his total screen time, using the median as a measure of, measure of average seems to imply that he is spending exactly the same amount of time uh, on his phone um, in both weeks. Now, comparing using the mode. The mode is the only measure of average that can be used when data is collected in categories, such as favorite sport. But again, sometimes the mode can be misleading when used as the only measure of average, as it is not based on all of the values in the data set, only the values that occur the most. So here we've got um, a learner, and we've got their English and their maths test scores. Each test was out of a total of 20 marks. So we've got their English score and their math score. Use the mode to compare the data sets. Explain why comparing the mode may not give a true reflection of the subject in which this learner performs better. So the mode for English, uh, it's only 14 that appears twice. None of the others do. So 14 is the mode for English. For maths, we've got two 12s there. So for maths, the mode is 12. For English, the mode is 14. So it looks, by comparing the mode, that English is the, the subject that the learner is doing better in. However, we can see that the maths results are much higher overall. Um, if we compared the mean, we would certainly find that the maths results were higher. Um, for English, as an example, 14 is the mode, but it's also the highest value. Whereas for maths, 12 is the mode, but it is also the lowest value. So by comparing the mode of these two data sets, it's, it's not really giving us a true reflection of the subject in which this learner performed better. Now, when we talk about range, we're not talking about average. Range is not a measure of average. Range is a measure of uh, the spread or the consistency of data. A low value would indicate that the data is consistent and there's little variance in the data. A high value for the range means there is a high variability in the data set. A high range can indicate the presence of outlying data, which could skew a measure of central tendency. Any measure of average is a measure of central tendency. So a high range um, can skew that measure. Okay, now before we can find the mean from a grouped frequency table, I think it's important that we first look at finding the mean from a frequency table. So, here we have uh, a table that shows the number of people in a household, and we're going to call that X, and then the frequency, we'll call that F. If we want to find the mean number of people per household, first of all, we multiply the frequency by the number of people. So calculate FX. And then we add up our totals, we divide it by the frequency, and obviously we're going to round up because you cannot have 4.7 people so we would say that the mean number of people per household uh, is five it may be worth thinking though is this the most appropriate measure of average to use for this particular data So if we compared it to the median, the median would be the 15th value. So that would be somewhere, uh, that would be in the threes. So three average number of uh, people in the household is three. If we compared it to the uh, mode, the modal value is also um, three. So perhaps having five people per household uh, is, is actually not necessarily the most appropriate measure of data to you of average to use for this particular um, set of data. So again, it's something to, worth considering 
um, with your learners, which is the most appropriate measure of average. OK, we'll look at grouped data now. Now, to understand why we calculate the mean from a group frequency table, it's useful for learners to first understand how and why data is grouped. As an example, we've got some data here from 30 runners running a five kilometer race. Um, if you go to if any, any of you out there, um, I recommend Part Run most highly, uh, not just as a source of data, but for something to do first thing on a Saturday morning. Um, it's quite good, uh, it's quite good fun, and it means that you get your exercise out of the way uh, for the day. So um, we've got the data here, and there's all these different times. It's pretty difficult to, to, to do very much with this data. Um, there's quite a lot of numbers there, and obviously if it, if it was a real part run um, data, uh, all of the part run, my local part run is about 300 runners, so that's an awful lot of data. Um, to look at. So grouping it is going to make it more easier to handle. Now, the first step to grouping data is to look at the highest and lowest values so that we can create sensible groupings that incorporate all of the data. So uh, for this particular data set, uh, 21 minutes and 12 seconds is the fastest, 44 minutes and 22 seconds is the slowest. So if we're going to group this data, we need to put it into a chart. Our columns will need labels. So we're going to put the time here and then we're going to put the frequency. And then we're going to come up with our grouping. So a sensible grouping would be um, to go from 20 to 25, 25 to 30, 30 to 35, 35 to 40, 40 to 45. Um, obviously, well, luckily, none of these timings are actually bang on um, a whole number of minutes because otherwise we'd have to make these groupings uh, 20 minutes to 24 minutes and 59 seconds because otherwise we, in theory, a time of 25 could be, we wouldn't know which group to put it into. So that's another thing to be aware of. Um, but once we've decided on our groupings, we can then pop in the frequencies So there's three in the first grouping, nine in the second, then we've got five, four, and then finally nine. Now, it would be possible to find the actual mean for this data since we have the raw data available. However, we often come across data that is already grouped. So we need to set a way to estimate the mean from a grouped frequency table. Uh, what you could do uh, to maybe spark some interest with your learners is get some newspaper cuttings of stories that, that would interest them that have group data in them or uh, maybe from their work or their studies uh, because it's it's highly likely that you'll be able to find data that is of interest to your to your learners. I'm interested in running so um, I've chosen that particular data. Now in this section, we're going to work through the steps to finding the mean from a group frequency table. A common error for learners is to treat a grouped frequency table like an ordinary frequency table and simply choose the upper or lower boundary to do their calculations. A good exercise would be before telling them to find the midpoint, um, you could ask them, well, well what happens? So let's explore this. Um, it will, let's, let's calculate using the lower boundary. What answer do we get? Let's calculate using the lower boundary. What answer do we get? Right, there's a big difference there. So what do we do about that? What, what could be the solution? Uh, and it may well be, if you, if you pose this to your learners, that one of them may suggest, well, let's, let's split the difference. Um, you know, let's split the difference between 61 and 71 make it in the middle and make it six to six thousands. Uh, and in truth, if you do split the difference between these two answers, you will get the same answer as if you had calculated the midpoint first. However, which is more efficient, calculating the midpoint and multiplying by the frequency 
for doing all of these calculations plus all of these calculations and finding the difference. Well, I know which I choose. So we're going to find the midpoint. Now, the standard method to find the midpoint, well, there's, there's two standard methods, really. I tend to do this, which is I take the smallest value from the largest value, divide by two and add this onto the lower banding in the group. However, there's actually, there is actually a more efficient way. Um, so for this, I, this is how I would do it. I would do 55,000, take 45,000 is 10,000. Half of 10,000 is 5,000. So I add 5,000 onto the 45,000, and that gives me 50,000 as my midpoint. Right, I know that always works, and so that is what I always do. However, it's actually much faster to add together the lower and the upper, and then divide by two. So 45,000 plus 55,000 equals 100,000. Divide that by two, it gives me my 50,000. Similarly here, 55,000 plus 65,000 gives me 120,000. If I divide that by two, I get 60,000 and so on. So whichever way you prefer is absolutely fine. Um, uh, but both methods are correct. But ultimately, once we've got that midpoint, however we found our midpoint, as long as it's correct, is absolutely fine to then carry on and do our calculations. So once we've got our midpoint, all we need to do is multiply by the frequency. So we we can add on an extra column onto our charts. And by all means, if your learners are doing um, paper-based assessments, they can draw an extra, extra column onto any chart that they have. Find the midpoint, do the midpoint times the frequency. And then once you've got the midpoint times the frequency, well, it's exactly the same process as we followed before. You find the total, divide it by the frequency, and that will give you your answer. So 66,000, which if we remember, was exactly what we would have found um, if we'd have split the difference between the lower boundary and the upper boundary earlier. Just a little bit faster way of going about it. Now, calculator skills. We can make the method more efficient by using the memory buttons on a basic calculator. So this is, a, is just my computer calculator, just so that I can show you on my screen here. Uh, for our on-screen assessments, we do not provide an on-screen calculator, but just to show you how we can make uh, use calculator skills to make this more efficient. So I need to do the frequency times the midpoint. So I do the three times 50,000 and I equals, okay. And I don't necessarily have to write that down, providing somewhere on my working box, I've got, I've got that three times 50,000. I'm then gonna put it into my memory. So I add it into my memory, then I cancel and I do the next bit, seven times 60,000, seven times 60,000 equals 420,000. I don't need to write that down. Um, I'm just going to add that into my memory. Memory. Uh, and then I go back to the start and do 70,000 times five equals 350,000. Add that to my memory. And then the last one, 80,000 times five equals 400,000. Add that into my memory, cancel everything off, and then do MR, memory recall. And my memory recall gives me the total, which if I divide by the, the um, frequency, gives me the same answer. So most standard basic calculators, are, I've got a £2.50 calculator here just from a uh, shop up the street. And that's got a memory plus button, memory minus button, an MR and an MC. Um, now, obviously, I've now used my memory button to do this calculation. I'm now going to note that into my answer box. I'm then going to clear my memory. So now I don't have anything in my memory, so I can't do the memory recall. So just basic calculator skills can actually really help your learners for finding the mean from a group frequency table. Now, in truth, once we know 
basic steps to follow for calculating the mean from a group frequency table is actually really quite straightforward. And if you encourage your learners to think for themselves and work methods out using common sense before you tell them the uh, specific steps, it, it might mean that they're able to use their common sense. So if they, if they forget, they can, they can work it out during an assessment. Obviously, it takes um, uh, less memory load, um, cognitive load in an assessment if they, if they just know that process without having to work it out. Um, but if they have managed to work it out for themselves at some point, then it's more likely that they're going to remember it in the first place. And now we'll take a look at some assessment questions from level two. So this first question comes from a level two non-calculator paper. Zach looks at the weather forecast. This table shows the highest daily temperatures forecast for the next eight days. The median of the 10 temperatures would be 17.5 degrees C. And the 10 temperatures have two modes. Use this information to find the forecast temperatures for day nine and day 10. So in order to solve this, first, I will look at the mode. That's the most straightforward one to, to look at. So we can see that the values, we've got 15 appearing three times, while 19 appears twice. So in order for there to be two modes, we need one of the these values um, to also appear three times. So that would be 19. So the mode has to be 15 and 19. There's no other numbers that it could possibly be in order for the 10 temperatures to have two modes. Now we can take a look at the median. So the median, we've got 10 values, so it's going to be between the fifth and the sixth values. So if we put all of the values in order, and then if we take a look at the fifth and sixth values, so the fifth and the sixth currently are 17 and 19. Well, that would give a median of 18, um, but we've been told that the median is not 18. The median is actually 17.5. So we need a value in between here in order to make that true, which would be 18, uh, because halfway between 17 and 18 is 17.5. So the missing values must be 18 and 19, and it wouldn't really matter which order I put those in but those are the two missing values. This next question comes from a level two calculator paper. The range of sale prices of flats in building A is 25,900 pounds. The mean sale price of flats in building A is 201,850 pounds. The table shows the sale prices of six similar flats in building B. Calculate both the range and the mean of the sale prices for flats in building B and use these values to make two comparisons between the sale prices in the two buildings. So by all means, you can pause this recording and solve this for yourself or alternatively, you can just think about how your learners um, would go about solving this and any problems that they may face. But we'll go through the answer now. So we need to find the range and the mean. So finding the range is quite straightforward. The range is the highest value minus the lowest value, and that gives us 26,600. And then the mean is simply all of the values added up and divided by six, which gives us 201,540. Now comes the hard bit. We have to make a statement. So we've, we've got the range, so we can see the range in the values. It's actually higher. Uh, and the mean price is lower. So we've got to make two comparisons. So what we could say is that the mean value for flats in building B 
is slightly less than the mean value for flats in building A. However, the range of values in building B is higher than in building A, showing more variance in the prices. And that's important. So if there's a, a statement made about range, then your learners need to include um, either the word uh, more variance or um, they're more consistent. So a low range would mean the values are more consistent, whereas a high range would mean the values are less consistent or more variable. Um, so please do make sure that you've covered those keywords with your learners. This next question comes from another level two calculator paper. Rani is asked to work out the average number of orders per month last year. The table shows the number of orders each month. Work out both the median and the mode for Rani and give one reason why the median is the better average for her to use. So, first thing we need to do is calculate the median and the mode. Now, the mode is the value that appears the most, and the only value that appears twice is 45 um, in months six and seven. For the median, we need to put the data in order, and then the median is going to come between the sixth and the seventh values. So we've got our data in order, and here are our sixth and seventh values. So we need to find the value in between. So the median is 146 plus 138 divided by 2, which is 142. So we've got our median, we've got our mode, but now what we have to do, and this is always a part that learners find difficult, is make a statement. Why? Why is the median a better average for her to use? Well, these are my own words. Um, however, your, your learners may word this in uh, any number of ways. But ultimately, the median is a better measure of average because it's more reflective of the usual monthly orders, or you could say it's more centralized, um, while the mode is significantly lower than all the other months. Or you could say the mode or value happens to also be the least value, so it's not central. So there's lots of different ways that your learners might might use um, to to make their sentence, but ultimately they do need to. If it says give a reason, then they need to reflect and um, come up with a reason. Uh, and for this particular example, it's it's really quite obvious. Um, the median is a it's it's a more fair reflection of, of the average number of orders per month, whereas the mode it's it's far too low. OK, this is a level two question, and you will find that in any of our live assessments, any question where your learners have to calculate the mean from a group frequency table will appear on a calculator paper. Um, because otherwise they're just spending far too much time doing multiplications and divisions that they're not uh, assessed for. So Eli looks for information on the cost of leaving gadgets on standby when they're not being used. Eli's gadgets are a TV, computer, printer, phone charger and two games consoles. He finds several reports stating how much electricity a gadget uses when left on standby, but they don't agree. Use an estimate of the mean to find out how much money Eli could save if he switched off his gadgets instead of leaving them on standby. Now, if I was taking a, a good approach to this in an assessment, I would be highlighting the number of gadgets he has. So he's got one, two, three, four, five, six gadgets in total. I'm going to need that for later. Um, I've got a table here which clearly shows a group frequency. And I've got a keyword here that says mean. So I know that I'm going to need to calculate the mean from a group frequency table and then compare it with um, the cost for the number of gadgets uh, he's got. So first of all, um, I've created my own table here. 
However, for ease, all your learners would need to make a note of is the midpoint and then uh, the midpoint times the frequency. Now, earlier on, we suggested there's two different ways of finding the midpoint when we have uh, values. So we can either add up the two values and divide by two, or we can look at the difference between them and then add that onto the lower value. Just beware, anything that has a zero, that zero is a value that is included, which means if we think about all of the values that are included between zero and four pounds 99 pence, we've actually got 500 values. Now half of 500 is 250. So the midpoint, when we have a, a grouping like this, it is a straight £2.50. We don't need to worry um, about going into, you know, halving 499 and then having a, um, a number here that's to three decimal places. So just consider that very carefully. Um, what we're doing is we're finding the middle value in this grouping. So the methods that we used earlier don't always work. Um, and this is something to be aware of. So we've got our midpoints here and we've multiplied by the frequency. So that's quite straightforward. We've got our totals and all we now need to do is divide our total, the midpoint times the frequency, by the number of reports that we've got or the frequency here. And so we've got 130 divided by 12 is £10.83. So the annual saving per gadget is you know, a mean value is £10.83. That's our estimate. And so since Eli, we've already said he's got six gadgets, then 10.83 times six comes to £65. Um, I actually left this value in my calculator. It was actually uh, 10.833333 recurring. So when I left that in my calculator and multiplied by six, it gave me a straight £65. Um, so that's how much Eli could potentially be saving based on the estimate of the mean. And this final question comes from another level two calculator paper. Some people donate to Chad by giving a one-off donation. The table below shows the one-off donations made last year. Other people donate by paying regular amounts. Last year, Chad had 150 of these regular donors who donated £7,500 in total. Sam works out an estimate for the mean of the one-off donations last year. He compares this with the mean for regular donors last year. Sam says the mean amount donated last year was higher for the one-off donors than for the regular donors. Is Sam correct? Show how you decide. Okay, so by all means, pause the recording and you can answer this for yourself or consider uh, how your learners would manage with a question like this. And we'll go through an answer now. So the first thing I would do in reading this question is I'd read it again. Um, so what's this question asking me to do? So I can see a group frequency table here. It talks about an estimate for the mean. So I'm going to need to calculate an estimate of the mean for these one-off um, donors and then I'm going to need to compare that with the mean for the regular donors and it says is Sam correct so I'm going to need a yes or a no answer and show how you decide I'm going to need to show my working so I know what I need to do so now I can carry out my calculations so again I've created a table here for the purposes of this recording. Um, in an assessment, your learners would really only need to just show the midpoint and the midpoint times the donors. So uh, the midpoint between 20 and zero is 10, between 40 and 20 is 30 uh, and so on. So we've got our midpoints and we can multiply that by the number of donors. So we've got these figures here and then we can do our totals. And in truth, I mean, your, your learners will be allowed a calculator for this, but just in case of calculator error, they may want to write in the working box 10 times 480, 30 times 4,380. Um, if they write down the calculations they do, 
then if they do get any mistakes, so say their total comes to a different total, if we've seen that they've done the correct multiplications, then they would still be able to uh, get a mark there. So once we've got our total and we've got our total number of donors, we can find an estimate for the mean of this grouped frequency table. So the estimate is 35 pounds is the mean donation for one-off donations donors and then if we compare this to the regular donors so it said that there was 7500 pounds donated by 150 donor donors we can see that actually the regular donors donate more so we can answer the question no the mean amount for regular donors was higher than the mean amount for one-off donors. So in summary, um, we did a work cloud in the live session, but by all means, you can think about what's your, what's your key takeaway from this session. So this is the answers from those who attended the session. In summary, mean, median, and mode are measures of average or central tendency. Range is a measure of spread. It shows the consistency or variance of data. Learners may need to make a comment about the measure of average that they use and why one measure of average is more representative. So that's why the focus for this session was less about how to calculate mean, median, mode um, and range, but more on the comments that they would need to make and using uh, comparisons. Make sure that learners understand what a group frequency table is, perhaps by creating their own, um, so that they're not just following the processes that you tell them to do because that is the way to do it. It's far better if they've got a bit of an understanding um, behind what, what they're doing so they can understand how um, calculating the mean from a group frequency table uh, comes about. And linked to that, encourage learners to use their common sense and logic to deduce methods uh, before perhaps teaching formal methods. They will need to know, um, you know, this is how uh, you calculate the mean from a group frequency table. But if you give them the opportunity to explore, uh, it's possible then the processes that they do end up following, they'll remember them uh, more readily than simply you dictating them to them to follow this process. Um, you know, give them a chance to think for themselves first before explicitly teaching. So upcoming training and events we have on our training and events page. Uh, please do come along to any of our either onboarding events, face-to-face -face events, our CPD sessions, drop-in clinics. There's also recordings um, on our training and events page two and a link to our teach share transform network where you can uh, come together with other providers and share your experience of delivering functional skills the key contacts are on this slide myself and patricia can help with english and maths and then rachel can assist with digital queries. Myself and Patricia do also support with digital queries, so feel free to contact us about those too. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you found this helpful. And like I mentioned at the start, if you would like the slides, or if you've got any questions following this session, please contact me directly. But please also do let me know what centre you are contacting me from, and if possible, your NCFE centre number. That will make it easier for me. So thank you so much for your time. I am from everybody. Uh, at NCFE, please continue to stay safe and take care. Thank you.